Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. Your glory, only your glory. 
Now, uh, it would be really easy for us this morning to be stuck in the reality that we are right in the middle of the doldrums of winter, but uh, summer is right around the corner. I promise it's there somewhere. Now, uh, if, to make things better, perhaps we could all imagine that it's summer. So maybe you close your eyes and you reflect and you get hit by the rays of sunshine. No, that's not just the lights, right? But summers are a great time for those of us in the Midwest. We love Summers, Minnesota summers especially. When, whenever you think of a Minnesota summer or a Midwest summer, some images that might pop into your mind are like campfires. Or maybe you're someone who goes down to the state fair, like the state fair is summer for you here in Minnesota. Or perhaps lakes, you're going out to the lake every weekend, to the cabin. Especially lake life and fishing. Those would be two things that I think just pop out when we think of Minnesota summers. And when you, if you're a fisherman or if you've spent any time fishing, especially here in the upper Midwest, you know for a fact that like the rite of passage for a real fisherman, especially in Minnesota, is to catch our state fish, the elusive walleye. Now, for some of you, you've been there, done that, like it's a big deal. But for, but for me, I've, I've gone pretty much my whole life and, and, and never had caught a walleye before. I would fish with my, with my family every summer and we'd catch fish, catch fish, but no, never any, any walleye until the summer of 2018. And we had gone out with my parents and uh, my family and I, and we were fishing on Cedar Lake, just outside the Twin Cities area, and, uh, and I got a bite. And after a, a really long fight and, and wrestling of this fish, I pulled it up and it was my first ever walleye. And I brought a picture. Here's a picture of me with my first walleye. Pretty impressive, right? Some of you are going, oh my goodness. Yeah, no, no, maybe, maybe I picked the wrong picture. Try this one, try this one instead. That, this is what I actually meant to show you. Yeah, okay, not, not, quite, not quite my hand. <laughs> Uh, however, I've caught other walleye since. But that was a big deal for me. It was like, oh, sweet, there, there it actually is. Now, some of you uh, for fishing professionals out there, you, you know how to hold a fish in front of a camera to make it look way bigger than it is. You know who you are, right? This morning, as we continue in our sermon series, we're looking at our statements of purpose. We're calling God's plans our purpose. We're looking at our statements of purpose as a church. These are statements that, that we've been uh, looking at that uh, kind of describe who we are as a church family. They describe what we're about. We kind of say, like, if we can do these four things really well, then that's going to equal us having a pretty substantial gospel impact, not just in our community, but even beyond as well. And so we started several weeks ago. We looked at a statement of purpose on worship and then discipleship, Last week, we took a look at care, and this week, we wrap up our fourth week, fourth and final week of looking into our last statement of purpose about evangelism. And I want to read to you uh, what's on our website and in our documents as a church on what we say about evangelism as our statement of purpose. Here's what, here's what it reads. It is essential that we as a congregation share Christ's burden to see souls saved, this is accomplished by integrating both the awareness of lostness and the availability of the gospel into all areas of ministry, across the street and around the world. Now, evangelism, that's how we would define it, that's how we would talk about it, that's our statement of purpose on it. Very easily, this is one of those things that be, can become quite like messed up in our minds a little bit. There can be some misconceptions about evangelism that pop out whenever we hear that word. It can be a loaded word, like that you might have a misconception of like, oh, that, that means that uh, that's the person that like is standing on the street corner, like shouting at people and, and preaching on the street corner. Well, is that evangelism? Uh, yeah, but is that the only type of evangelism? No. Or the person that's going door to door, knocking on doors and can I tell you about Jesus? Is that evangelism? Absolutely. Right? Is that the only and primary way of evangelism? No. Some people have the misconception of in order to be an evangelist or to, to, to have evangelism happen, you need to go away, you need to go to another country, you need to go to overseas and be a missionary. Again, is that evangelism? Yes. Is that the full scope of it? No. As we've gone through this series on our statements of purpose, 
Another thought has popped into my head where it's like, man, you know, as we look at these, another misconception that we can have just about all these things we've been talking about the last couple of weeks is a very common one in the church too. We can look at our statements of purpose on worship and discipleship and care and even evangelism and, and it can be easy for someone to think, man, I'm just so happy that my church does this stuff. I'm glad that, that I attend a church that, that thinks these things are a big deal and they do that. That makes me feel good, right? That would be a misconception, right? Because this is not, the ch- this is not like, oh, I'm glad that the staff does this. I'm glad that my pastor does this. No, this is an all of us thing. Like all of us are in agreement that like these would be four things that all of us are responsible to see happen and and do and be a part of for a part of this church. So this is a we thing, not a select few thing. Today, God's word is going to help us. It's going to help us unpack and define and, and kind of describe a little bit more about evangelism and its place in the life of a follower of Jesus. And so we're going to be using, obviously, uh, God's word as our primary source for this. And uh, the primary context that we're going to be looking at today in our main text from the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is going to be teaching about evangelism, but he's going to connect it and, and run a parallel to something very common that we set ourselves up with this morning. He's going to connect evangelism to fishing. And he's going to have these principles of of fishing that tie directly into what it means to do evangelism. And so we call this this morning a carpenter's guide to fishing. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 4. So I invite you to turn there if you have your Bibles or you can follow along on the words on the screen. Uh, Short text this morning, just verses 18 through 22 of Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is God's word. All right, so Jesus comes to us this morning. He comes to these four, comes to us through his word, and he's describing evangelism, what it means, right? And he's tying it into fishing. And so the first fishing principle that Jesus wants us to be aware of and to consider this morning is this, know what you are fishing for. Know that you are fishing for. Now, we probably should set that up with a disclaimer that you must first recognize that as a follower of Jesus, you are sent to fish, right? We'll talk about that as well. Like, that's kind of part of the disclaimer here. You are sent to fish as a follower of Jesus, so you should know what you are fishing for. We see an example of this in our text today. Obviously, the disciples, these first four, they were clearly fishing for fish. It was their livelihood. It was their job. It's what they were doing, right? Jesus says, you're fishing for the wrong thing. I'm going to have you fish for something else. I'm going to have you fish for people. Like, imagine, just think practically. Like, what would that have sounded like to have heard that come out of Jesus' mouth? Like, fish for people? What are you talking about, Jesus? But Jesus is clear to these four. He says, know what you're fishing for. And that's a practical word of advice for any regular fisherman, right? If you're fishing for fish, you you should know what you're fishing for. You should know the right location and the right habitat of the fish. You should know the the body of water that you're on. You should have the right tools and the right equipment. You should have things like the correct bait and the right hook and the the correct line on your fishing pole and and, and and maybe even a boat. Some of you are thinking, yeah, always a bigger boat, right? Right? But here Jesus isn't talking about fishing for fish, except all those things that I just listed kind of directly translate into his expression of fishing for people. It's all of these things, and well, you need to be aware of the location and the habitat, the community that you've been placed in. You need to know the situation you've been put in. You have to have the right tools and the right equipment and the right resources to fish for people. All of these things apply as well. And Jesus says the main difference here, one of the, another main difference is you're going to be casting a wide net 
but it's not a fishing net. It's the net of the gospel to catch people up into the kingdom of God and to bring them in. Fish for people. And so what we see is that evangelism is very closely connected and really a part of the discipleship process. Right, usually we, we, this text is, is Jesus calls his first disciples. You might think, well, discipleship, right? But you see evangelism is closely connected. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will send you out to fish for people. And it's here that we get kind of the main, one of the main purposes of the church. One of the main purposes of the church is to make disciples. We hear that a lot. One of the main ways that a church makes disciples is by telling people about Jesus. So think of your own life. Like clearly, somewhere along the way, someone told you about Jesus. Do you remember who it was? Do you remember where you were when that happened? Could have been a parent or a grandparent or a Sunday school teacher. Who was it that first told you about Jesus? And if you're a follower of him, like you can be thankful not only for that person, but for the ongoing telling about Jesus in your life as this gift of faith was created and has grown into where you are now. Kind of an interesting story to think about. Here at Triumph, we, we love telling people about Jesus. It's what we do. It's what we're a part of. It's what is in the fabric of everything we do. It's telling people about Jesus. And we do that in a couple of main contexts, which what the church is called to do, to, to proclaim that good news both near and far, both locally and globally. So we, do, we don't only look at what happens in this room. We look at what happens in the rest of this building and all the ministries that happen. How are we telling people about Jesus? We look around us in our, in our community. Are there, are there opportunities that we are taking advantage of as a church to let people know about Jesus? And obviously our connections even beyond the physical region that we're a part of, and it's around the globe. How do we tell people about Jesus? And that looks different for each individual and each church, but we believe it's both, local and global, near and far. Let's take a look at, at God's word for a moment here and, and how God's word would define this, uh, this situation, this context of evangelism. Uh, there's two main New Testament words that are kind of brought up uh, all throughout the New Testament about talking about this evangelism, this, this going, this telling people about Jesus. Uh, the first Greek word is, is kind of where the word evangelism comes from. It's euangelion. And euangelion really just is translated as good news. So right, it's telling people the good news, the good news of the gospel. Another word that's used is martyreo. And that's where we get our word martyr. And, and in its context, this means that it's someone who's bearing witness to something. Someone who's testifying about something. You think of someone in a courtroom, right? You bring in a witness, someone who's there, who saw, who experienced, who can, who can testify that, yes, this is true. This actually happened. You can take my word for it. I was there. I saw it. It happened to me. I experienced it. All right, so both of those words, euangelion and martyreo, this, this good news and this witness, these are the two words that kind of hold the fabric together of the New Testament when it comes to evangelism. A couple of uh, scripture passages that bring this out. Uh, we think of Matthew 28, right? We read it a couple weeks ago in the context of discipleship, right? But, but it's really an evangelistic statement too, right? The Great Commission, Jesus sending out his disciples. He says, go into all the world, there, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Right? Going with the good news. In Acts 1, before the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And here's that word, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, the rings of influence keep getting bigger, right? Now, when, it, when we think of fishing and we think of a witness, like, it's pretty important. You think about, like, the classic fish story. Right? You tell somebody about this fish that you caught. Right? And if you were there, it was a pretty, you, it's always a remarkable story. A good fishing story is great. Right? If, you tell, if I came back and told somebody, like, yeah, I, I, I once caught like a 40-inch walleye. 
you'd want to know like, well, where's the proof? That sounds almost unreasonable. Like, where's the picture or where's the person that was there to say, yeah, that actually happened. Ben wasn't just making that up, right? And, and sometimes if, if, if it's a bad witness in a fish story, you know that oftentimes what happens in a fish story is the size of the fish keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger the more you tell it and the story gets more elaborate and more grand, right? This is no fish story, right? God's word in evangelism, closely connected together. You know what else evangelism does as we see in God's word? It also connects us to the heartbeat of God. God has an evangelistic heart. And we see that all throughout his word and, and specifically in the New Testament, right? We see that the, this takes place in, in the will of God, right? God's will is that people come to know him. In, in 1 Timothy 2, okay, uh, the apostle Paul is writing about God. He says, God who, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Okay, God's will is that everyone would be caught into this net of the kingdom of God. We also see that it's Jesus' main purpose for coming to earth. His main purpose in coming here is to find those who have not yet been a part of the kingdom and to bring them in. In Luke 19, Jesus said of, of himself, he said, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Right? We have that word in our statement of purpose, this awareness of lostness, that there are people who are lost, who are without knowing Jesus. How do, how do we bring them in? How do we tell them about him? That's Jesus' main purpose. And, and lastly, we see that, that on account of that, that, that we as his followers, as the people of Jesus, we are his sent ones. After his resurrection, he comes to see his disciples. And in John 20, Jesus said again, I say to you, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you, right? Now think about that for a moment. Uh, Jesus could have uh, told people about himself in a, in a lot of ways that would probably be way better and more efficient and effective than having it up to us, right? Um, he could have had his angels just go around and deliver the news to everyone. But he says, no, 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 you're gonna be the ones to do it. You're gonna be the ones to tell other people about me. You do it with your words, you do it with your actions, you do it with your life. Tell them about me. You are the sent ones. And so as you sit here this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus, do you also see yourself as a fisher of people? If, if you don't, well, then you're missing a pretty big part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Do you see yourself as someone who is coming alongside in this purpose to cast the net of the gospel to bring people in, to tell people about the, about the good news of Jesus? Do you see yourself as a fisher of people? Principle number one, know what you're fishing for. Principle number two, trust your guide. Imagine if you're going to an unfamiliar uh, source of water, let's say you're a fisherman and you're like, oh man, I've heard the Alaska fishing is just incredible, never been there. Uh, more than likely what's gonna happen is uh, you're not gonna spend all this time and money and resources to fly to Alaska and try to figure it out on your own. No, you're gonna ask for help. You're gonna probably like hire a guide or have someone like show you where the, where's a good spot to go and what do I need to do and how would I catch these fish, these, the, the salmon, right? Uh, if you're just fishing locally and you're like, I think I want to try a different lake. Where, where would I go? I mean, some of you would just drive your boat around and like put the boat in the water and see what happens, right? But maybe you know someone who's like, well, I know my friend, he's fished this lake before. Maybe he can tell me uh, where the fish are biting or where a good spot to go is so that I don't have to try to figure it out on my own because I don't know what I'm doing, right? Sometimes you need to ask for help. You need a fishing guide, and we see this principle played out, trust your guide, as Jesus calls his first disciples. We think of the context again. Jesus comes to these four guys who are right in the middle of their busy day and a busy work week, and he calls them, and they drop everything, and they leave. They follow him. Now, on, a, on just a, like an initial reading of this, like it would be very natural of us, and I know I've been in this camp before. It's like, you, oftentimes, we just kind of glorify the disciples. I don't want, I don't want to minimize, like, it's a pretty big deal that they did this. Like, that's quite impressive. Like, I, I don't know that I would just do that exactly like that, right? But the broader context would suggest that it's maybe not as impressive as we think. Like, we're just perplexed and amazed. Like, oh, they just left everything. Oh my goodness, these guys had such incredible faith to just leave everything and follow this stranger. Well, in all likelihood, they had a prior relationship 
with Jesus. The beginning of the Gospel of John kind of details this, where uh, Andrew especially was a, a disciple of John the Baptist. And so after Jesus is baptized, Andrew changes his allegiances. He, he starts to follow Jesus and he tells Peter, his brother, about Jesus. And so these guys had a prior relationship with Jesus. They had some connection with him. They knew who he was. They had been associated with him. They were following him around before. More than likely, they had been to the wedding at Cana and saw Jesus' first miracle of turning the, well, the water into wine. They had seen his power. The level of their faith and trust in him, sure, we don't know that for sure, but they knew who he was. And he comes and he says, follow me. Now, even this is interesting because culturally, Jesus is a rabbi. He's a teacher, right? And so uh, he, he would have been respected in his community as such. He's called teacher. He's called rabbi even by his disciples, right? In those days, a rabbi-student relationship would look something like this. If you were a young person, specifically a young boy, looking to study to be a rabbi, you would approach a rabbi and ask to study under him, You'd say, hey, I, I want to learn what it takes to be a rabbi, to be a teacher in the temple. And so could you show me, could I just follow you around? Could you show me what that looks like, what that means? I want to imitate you. I want to do things as you do so that one day I can have my own followers and do what you do. Notice, though, it was the student initiating that with the teacher. It was the student asking the teacher. And so there's some really uniqueness and intentionality about Jesus coming and approaching these guys. The teacher asks the students, hey, come spend some time with me. And uh, that'd be like the Alaskan fishing guy just kind of standing uh, as, you, as the plane lands and, and the people are getting off and, and, the, and the fishing guy going, hey, would you come let me show you how to fish? I'll show you where the good spots are, right? Like typically you hire the guide. The guide doesn't hire you, right? And in this case, in this situation, Jesus approaches the disciples. He says in verse 19, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people, now again, imagine what the disciples are thinking, especially since they know Jesus. And sure, he's a rabbi, right? But, but he's also a carpenter. Like imagine Peter, and Peter's kind of blunt. We know that about him. Imagine him thinking like he's hearing Jesus say this. He's like, okay, Jesus, you're a carpenter, right? Uh, you know how to work with wood. Like I'm the fisherman, right? I know how to fish. I've been fishing my whole life. Fishing's kind of my thing. I know what I'm doing. Like, don't give me advice on how to fish. And yet, how many times in the Bible do we see, in the Gospels especially, how many times do we see example after example, there's at least two of the disciples fishing all night, catching nothing, Jesus standing on the shore saying, hey, why don't you try to throw your nets on the other side of the boat? And they go, okay, yeah, whatever, let's humor the carpenter and they pull in a massive load of fish. So though he's a carpenter, does Jesus know a lot about fishing? I guess so. <laughs> does Jesus know a lot about evangelizing? I guess so. Trust your guide. Jesus said, follow me. Trust me on this. If you looked at the disciples, they were not probably the first pick for any rabbi to teach a student, they, they, they were totally unequipped for this. They were completely underqualified for this. They had absolutely no knowledge of what this even meant, fishing for people. They had no experience in how to do it. They were about as clueless as could be. And yet Jesus says, trust me, follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. You know, the future tense of this in, in God's word gives this incredible picture of Jesus saying, you, you spend some time with me, you follow me, and, and, and you'll become way better at fishing for people than you ever were at fishing for fish. Wow. That is the good news of the gospel. You think about that principle in your own life, that who are we? Not just who are we to tell people about Jesus, but who are we that to have anything to do with Jesus? We are not worthy. 
We are the ones not qualified. We are the ones who are not equipped. We are the ones that have no credentials, and yet Jesus comes to us. He seeks us. He calls us. He equips us. He qualifies us. He makes us into something more than we could ever make on our own. That's like this process of sanctification, this daily renewal of the Holy Spirit doing this work, transforming our hearts and our lives to be more and more like Jesus, to be more and more in his image. And that's a process that he does. And so for you and I, you, are not, you and I are not finished products. We're a work in progress, right? And what we will be is still being made as Jesus works on our lives. That's an act of grace. So know what you're fishing for. Trust your guide and the final principle that Jesus gives this morning. Be aware. Be observant. Be patient. The true task of a fisherman. There is no quality that fits alongside fishing like patience. Because sometimes the fish aren't biting. And you're sitting there for hours. And the sun's hot or it's raining or it's, the wind's cold, Right? And nothing's biting. I can remember one of the first times I took my kids when they were younger uh, fishing. And of course, you get them on the boat and they're all excited to spend time on the boat. They got their life jackets and they got their little fishing poles and they're ready to go. They're ready to reel in the 50-inch walleyes, right? And uh, about after, oh, you know, five minutes of sitting there and not uh, catching anything, you know, that you could see it in their face. They start to wonder like, so uh, are we done yet? Uh, can we go in? Like, I want to go play. This is boring. I'm hungry. When are the fish going to bite? Right? It's five minutes. I was hoping to at least get 30, right? Fishing and patience is a virtue. Fishing takes time. Evangelism takes time. And we know that because evangelism typically happens in a relationship. Think about for the disciples. Like they had a relationship with Jesus. He wasn't a random stranger asking them a random question. Right? They knew him. They had spent some time with him. Right? And he calls them to follow him. Evangelism happens in a relationship. And so the first two principles of us, as we are in relationship with people, Jesus says, the same as fishing, be aware of where you are. Be observant of what's going on. Be aware of the people in your life. Be observant of the conversations that are happening. Right? Who knows, someone that you know could come up and ask you this question like, hey, I see, I see you go to church. Like, tell me about that. What? In God's word, 1 Peter 3, we read, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared. Always be aware. Always be observant. Always be ready. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Right? Who knows who's going to ask you a question or make a comment that is an invitation to tell someone about Jesus? Hey, tell me about this hope that you have. Are you ready for that conversation? Are you aware? Are you observant? Where are the places that God has put you right now? He's put you in situations where this happens. And it really starts close to home. Think about this. God's given you, many of you, a family, right? Could be an immediate family that lives in your house. Okay, it could be extended family that is close by. He's given you people in your life, in your inner circle, family, friends. How do you tell them about Jesus? He's given you classmates and teammates and coworkers. How do you tell them about Jesus? How do you give a reason for this hope that you have as you're approached? Another misconception of evangelism is it's like just the theology police. I'm just beating people across the head with, with apologetics and convincing them and winning them over for Jesus. I don't know that that's evangelism. Evangelism happens in the context of a relationship as you come alongside someone, as, they, as you spend time with them, as they, as they look at your life, as they look at your choices, they see how you live and they go, man, what is with you? You're different. You're not like other people. Can you tell me about that? 
I had this happen to me. Uh, it's happened a couple of times, but uh, the most, some of the most recent, uh, you know, being aware, observant, and ready, uh, these happen in everyday interactions. And so, uh, like most people, I get my hair cut. And uh, I, I, I hate, like, awkward silence. And so, like, anytime there's a conversation and it's quiet for more than, like, a second and a half, I've got to interject with a question. Now, I am genuinely curious, but I also want to break the silence, right? Well, when you're sitting making small talk getting your hair cut, like, oh, that's rough, that's painful. And so oftentimes I will just start asking questions to the person cutting my hair and get them talking and, and then I don't have to talk and talk about myself. And, but uh, a couple of times, uh, this person who's cut my hair, they ask me the classic question. It's not the weather, it's, so, so what do you do? What do you do? Uh, well, uh, what do you say? You know, like, uh, I work with people. Uh, I'm like a, a teacher, kind of, you know. No, what do you do? I'm a pastor. You know. One of the times, the one young woman who asked me that question said, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. She said, what's that like? <laughs> How much time you got? No. <laughs> what's that like? And I got to tell her, I, and I kind of was pretty honest. I wanted to be genuine. Right? I gave her this answer. She was, she was genuinely curious. She just wasn't looking to know, like, oh, what do you do? Oh, that's interesting. Let's move on. Right? Like, Tell me about that. What is that like? We had a great conversation. No, it's not like I was winning her heart to Jesus or anything. It was an opportunity that I was thankfully observant about. I wasn't expecting it. But these happen in everyday interactions. Where are the places that God has put you? Who are the people that God has put in your life? Right? God's given us family and friends and classmates and teammates and co-work. He's, he's given us neighbors. I love G.K. Chesterton's quote on this. He says, we make our friends, we make our enemies, but God makes our next door neighbor. Why? Because they're right there. They're right there. Like the, the, the pathway to evangelism, the pathway of telling people about Jesus, it starts really close to home in your immediate family. And as far as being the sent ones, like, how about across the street or right next door? How do you begin to tell your neighbors about Jesus? How do you evangelize your neighbors? Everyday interactions. So are you aware? Are you observant? And are you patient? Lastly, as we wrap up our time together, it's not just being aware of the conversations that happen. It's being aware of your own story. Did you know that your story and your experience speaks volumes to people? Especially in our postmodern world today of like, well, you can't knock someone's story or someone's experience. You might disagree, or you might not see it the same way, but you can't knock their story or their experience. Your story and your experience of how God has worked and moved in your life speaks volumes to people. It's powerful. The good and the bad, the ups and the downs, the places where you got it right, but most of the time it's the places you just got it flat wrong. And God worked his grace into your life. The Apostle Paul knew about this. In fact, his main witness to testifying to who God is and how great God is came through God's work in his life, in his mess. And he writes about this to a young man named Timothy. Paul writes this in 1 Timothy 1. About his story, he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason... I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Your story, your experience of God's patience with you and with me as sinful, broken people. What does that tell people? about Jesus. God is patient with you. He is patient with me. He's patient with me in our lives and how we live. He's patient with you and with me and how we struggle in this area of evangelism. 
He's patient with you and me as we go on this journey of life. Second Peter 3 reminds us, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The good news of Jesus is the best kind of fishing story. It's one that's a part of your life. It's your story. It's my story. And we get to tell it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the ways that you come to us, that you initiate relationship with us. We marvel at uh, why you would want to have, any, have anything to do with us as broken, sinful people who don't have life together. And yet in your grace and your goodness and in your kindness, you come to us, you do a mighty work in our life, and you invite us to be a part of your storytelling of your love and grace to, to humankind. And so, Lord, as we think about evangelism, as we think about um, the story of our lives, as we tell it both in word and in just how we live, I pray that you'd help us to be aware and observant and even patient with the relationships in our lives. Lord, and as you provide opportunity, help us to see an opportunity to tell others about how good you are. Lord, help us in that. Remind us again and encourage us as we go from this place. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Doug, and I want to take a minute and, and say thank you for watching the worship service today. If you'd like to extend your time of worship, we have a couple links to worship songs that fit today's message in the description down below. You simply click, and you can spend more time with Jesus in your day today. I have three quick thoughts that I wanted to share with you, and it'll only take a minute. First, we'd love to connect with you. If you'd be willing, you can visit our website at triumphlbc.org connect and let us know how we can reach you. Or you can visit triumphlbc.org events to find an activity that you could jump into. Second, we hope that you see this content as a supplement to your walk with Jesus. Our digital content really isn't designed to replace belonging and engaging with a gospel community. So whether that's here at Triumph or at another church, we invite you to find a community that you can connect with. And third, we invest a lot of resources into producing content that's used to bless people just like you all over our community. If this or any of the other resources we have here at Triumph have blessed you, would, would you consider giving? It's because of your generosity that we are able to continue creating and serving online.